So the, the title of this talk is Does Human Vision Triangulate Absolute Distance? And in this talk I want to do two things. So first, I want to convince you that there is a paradox at the heart of visual scale. And then second, I want to go on to try and propose a solution. Right. So the background to all this is a suggestion that the static monocular retinal image is ambiguous as to scale. Right. So we need a source of absolute distance information to tell us whether what we're looking at is a small object up close or a large object far away. Right. And generally in the literature there's sort of two general strategies to this. So one is to rely on pictorial cues within the retinal image itself. Right. So you've got absolute distance cues like familiar size, the ground plane, and defocus blur. But the other approach is to say, well, actually, this, this is an ill-posed problem. And it tries to move us away from the static monocular retinal image by introducing multiple viewpoints, so either from binocular vision or from the motion of the observer. So here you can have vergence, you can have accommodation, you can have vertical disparities, and you can have motion parallax. So if these are all the absolute distance cues, what I want to argue is the paradox is this. right? We know that in natural viewing conditions, triangulation cues dominate pictorial cues so far as absolute distance is concerned, right? So the claim is, is, is it's the triangulation cues that are dictating the visual scale of the scene. But what I want to go on to argue is that if we actually look at the triangulation cues individually, right, none of them appear to be that effective, right? Which leads to this general question, what determines visual scale, right? So, just to emphasize, that's the paradox, right? Triangulation cues dominate pictorial cues so far as absolute distance and scale is concerned, and yet none of these triangulation cues appear to be that effective. So the first thing I need to convince you of is this idea that none of these triangulation cues are that effective. So if we go through them one by one, if we start with motion parallax, what I'm going to do here is refer you to two influential discussions in the literature, right? So the first is from a review of uh, different egocentric distance cues in virtual reality. And Renner and colleagues found when they looked at motion parallax that there is no empirical evidence that providing motion parallax improves distance perception in virtual environments. Now the same is true if we look at the work of the Utah group, so people like William Thompson, uh, Sarah Krimuga and Janine Stefanucci, who've all been instrumental in bringing virtual reality into perception science. So they, in their book with Roland Fleming, also look at absolute distance cues, right? And they say, yeah, accommodation, vergence, the ground plane, and familiar size can all be absolute distance cues. But actually, they, they, looking at the evidence, they're also skeptical that motion parallax is functioning as an effective absolute distance cue. The next thing we can look at is vertical disparities. Um, now, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to being corrected on this, there's only one paper in the literature that suggests that an isolated object, uh, that vertical disparities can scale the distance of an object viewed in isolation, right? And that's Rogers and Bradshaw in 1995. But even they suggest that if the object takes up less than 20 degrees of the visual field, it's going to be vergence that scales its distance rather than vertical disparities. You'd also want to look at studies like Sobel and Collette, which used 30 degrees of the visual field and found no effect, right? So since objects in the visual field aren't typically taking up 20 degrees, 30 degrees, even more, right, this doesn't seem to be a plausible candidate for how we're scaling distance in the real world. What about accommodation? Well, that too has been studied in the literature. Right? So Mon Williams and Tresillian had subjects point to the distance of dots with the accommodative demand varied. But they found that it is clear that accommodation is providing no functionally useful metric distance information for these observers. The responses were unrelated to the actual distance of the target. So all that leaves so far as triangulation cues are concerned is vergence, right? the angular rotation of the eyes. But thankfully here the story is a lot more positive, right? So both Mont Williams and Tresillian and Vigia Clement and Trotter looked at the relationship between the vergence angle and, and the perceived uh, distance of objects and found a very strong relationship, almost veridical relationship, within arm's reach. Okay. But what I want to do is, is to challenge these results. Right? And I think the problem with these results is the way the stimuli are typically presented in these experiments. So what they involve is a, is a subject sat in complete darkness with their vergence at a resting state, 
and then the stimulus suddenly presented as close as 20 centimetres. And that's going to introduce three confounding cues. Right? So the first is diplopia, double vision. If you present a point of light, you're going to see it as double initially. The second is, as the subjects make a convergence eye movement, there's going to be motion of the stimulus on the retina. So it could be that subjects are either responding to just the sheer amount of diplopia or the sheer amount of motion on the retina in these experiments. And then the third issue is, if you ask people to suddenly converge on objects 20 centimetres away, they're going to be consciously aware of their own eye movements, right? And that's not typically how we judge distances in the real world, so I also think that's another confounding cue that should be controlled for. So what I did was have subjects sit in a stereoscope and, and put uh, two points of light at the end of the stereoscope, but it was set up that subjects saw it as a single fused dot, right? And so what they did was to point to the distance of the dot, so a lot like Mon Williams and Tresillian. But the difference is, rather than after each trial switching the stimulus off and then representing it at, a, at another vergence distance, I had the subjects look at a fixation target and gradually vary their vergence between trials, between present, next presenting another dot and then getting them to point to the distance of that as well. So the question is, what does this revised paradigm do to our ability to estimate distance from virgins? Well, the first thing is we see a vast reduction in uh, the, the influence of virgins on absolute distance, right? So whilst Mon Williams and Tresillian found a close to veridical relationship between virgins and, and perceived distance, in these results what we find is, okay, there's a, there's a small bias, so there's a slope of 0.16, but it's vastly reduced um, from the close to veridical performance. But the more interesting point is when we move away from the aggregate data to the raw data, right? And it becomes immediately apparent, and, and just note the slight change in scale on the y-axis. It becomes immediately apparent that vergence is providing no effective absolute distance information for these observers, right? Basically, they're guessing, okay? Good. So that's vergence as a distance cue. What about vergence as a cue to size? Well, what we can look at is, is the so-called Taylor illusion. This is a suggestion that if you have an afterimage of the hand, right, and then you move your physical hand closer to you, you're going to see it reduce in size. Or if you move your physical hand further away from you, you're going to see it increase in size. Right? Now, Sperendio and colleagues looked at this, and they found a strong linear relationship between vergence and perceived size. And the reason they attribute this effect almost entirely to virgence is they also had a condition where they set the movement of the hand and virgence in opposite di di uh, directions. And what they found was only a modest reduction in the effect. Right? So they, they feel pretty confident attributing this effect uh, to the virgence change. So in order to test this, what I did was I had subjects look at a target. Right? And the target could either increase by a variable amount over five seconds or decrease by a variable amount over five seconds. And all they were asked to do was judge, did the target get bigger or get smaller, right? But at the same time, I was moving, changing their vergence from 50 centimeters down to 25 centimeters on each and every trial. And the question is, does this change in vergence in any way bias the size judgment, right? So what would we expect? Well, if we have the, the physically induced change in the target size along the x-axis, and probab probability of judging the target is getting bigger along the y-axis, with the just chance of 50-50 in the dotted line, then if vergence wasn't a cue to size, we would expect the psychometric function to go through zero, right? So, uh, you know, subjects are at 50-50 at chance, just when we don't induce a physical change into the stimulus, right? That seems, that seems pretty obvious. But if virgins is acute to, to size, then even if we don't induce a change in the size of the stimulus, because virgins is changing, the subjects are going to see the target getting smaller. And so we need to introduce a physical size change to counterbalance that. And if you look at Sperandio and colleagues, it could be as much as 70%. Right? So the question of this experiment was, well, which of these two psychometric functions did we find? And the answer is the one that goes through zero. Right? So I'm going to show you the results for 11 uh, participants, which are on exactly the same axes, okay? 
Okay, good. So what you'll see is that you know some subjects may be shifted to the left by, by minus two degrees, some shifted to the right by, by, by one degree, but basically all of these observers are, are clustering around zero, right, as their point of subjective equality when they can't determine whether the target's getting bigger or smaller. So what you basically want to do is take these individual observers and build a hierarchical Bayesian model to try and estimate, well, what is the population bias viewed as a whole? We did that and simulated it, and, and, and these are the distribution of the posteriors. And what you find is a very negligible bias, minus 0.2% change in size, that isn't statistically significant. Right? And if you wanted to interrogate these figures more, what you could do is a, a JZS base factor and try and analyze, well, you know, how likely are these results under the null hypothesis? How likely are they actually reflecting a small true effect size? And the base factor suggests actually these are four times more likely under the null hypothesis. Another thing you can do, though, is say, well, look, you know, let's presume there is a small true effect here of, of virgin size constancy. How big could it plausibly, plausibly be? And the answer, according to an inferiority test, is less than 1% size change, right? But we know at the same time that even our most sensitive observer can't detect a size change in this experiment of less than 1.5%, right? So even if there were a small true effect buried in there somewhere, it's small enough as to be dismissed. Good. So that brings us to the end of vergence and with it triangulation cues, right? So if you wanted another way out of the dilemma, what you could then try and argue is, OK, I accept your position on triangulation cues, but what evidence do you have that triangulation cues dominate pictorial cues in natural viewing conditions? And the evidence for this comes from telestereoscopic viewing, right, from Helmholtz, who showed us that if, if a subject looks at the scene, in, in, you know, natural scene, and you, you arrange the mirrors so to effectively increase their interpupillary distance, they're going to see that scene as a miniature, right? So if you could put your, your 3D glasses on, I'm going to try and give you an example of this. Okay. So this is a, a, a nice uh, normal scene in Germany. This has got no stereo in it, right? This is a normal scene. See how it works. So this is the same scene with telestereoscopic viewing. Uh, so an increase in, in the IPD beyond what you'd usually expect from uh, normal hum human viewing. I don't know if that, that works okay for people. And so generally what people uh, report in the, of, of these kinds of scenes is that they see a, a miniature scene, right? And so the fundamental question is, well, you know, you're maintaining all the same pictorial cues, right? The only thing you're changing are the, the so-called triangulation cues. So what is it about the triangulation cues that is changing uh, the size of the scene? Now, if you're Helmholtz, the answer is vergence, right? If you're Brian Rogers, the answer is vergence and vertical disparities. But I've given you independent reasons for being skeptical of both of these as, a, as the source of, of absolute distance information. So what I want to try and do is, 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 at least in the final minute, sort of sketch the beginnings of a solution to this problem, right? So think about it. What are we manipulating so far as triangulation cues are concerned in telestereoscopic viewing, right? We're manipulating vergence, we're manipulating vertical disparities, but we've considered those. The only thing left are horizontal disparities, right? So what I want to argue is that horizontal disparities are functioning as absolute distance cues. Right. That's already a departure from the literature. I, I'd push it even further and even argue that potentially horizontal disparities are some of, if not our most important, absolute distance cues. Right. Now that in and of itself sounds paradoxical, right? So, so how is this account going to work? Well, it's the opposite of size constancy. So size constancy is, uh, sorry, depth constancy, forgive me. Depth constancy is the following argument, right? We know that the angular size of an object, that is its x-axis and its y-axis, falls off with distance. Right? We know its z-axis depth falls off with distance squared. So in order to preserve its 3D shape with distance, right, we have to know that d, we have to know that distance. Okay. So I want to invert that argument. I want to suggest that 
the fact that we don't have depth constancy with distance, the fact that we are used to seeing you know, mountains on the horizon looking flat, buildings in the distance looking flat, and a fall off in stereo depth of an object with distance, gives us the means by which, if we already know the 3D shape of the object from distance invariant pictorial cues, gives us the means by which to find that distance. Right. So how would that work, in, in just to sketch it, in our, our example of the street scene? Well, what you'd be basically arguing is, look, we all, we all appreciate, we all experience the accentuated stereo in that scene. Right? But the only way that that accentuated stereo can be consistent with either A, the 3D shape or geometry of the object in the scene, or B, 3D shape or geometry of the scene itself, is that we're looking at a small object up close, right? So that's, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation, which I also have some sympathy for, is actually it's all just natural scene statistics, right? So the suggestion here is, forget about trying to work out the, the specific geometry of the scene from the <coughs> objects or from the scene itself, and just come to the, the, the very basic point that in, in natural scenes, we only experience this degree of stereo depth from horizontal disparities when we're looking at something up close, right? So that would be another approach, is to say, look, forget about the, the 3D geometry and just ask, when do you actually experience that sort of accentuated stereo depth? Good. So to conclude, I've argued that vergence really isn't an effective absolute distance or absolute size cube. Um, I've argued that this implies a paradox uh, for visual scale, right? So triangulation cues, we know, dominate pictorial cues in terms of absolute size and scale, but at the same time, this implies that none of the triangulation cues are that effective. And I argue that the only way out of this dilemma is to rely on horizontal disparities to provide you with absolute uh, distance and size. So all that's left is to say thank you to everyone who's helped me with this project. Uh, so Christopher Tyler, Josh Solomon, Matteo Lisi, Simon Grant, Salma Ahmed, and Chris Hull. And finally, to plug my book. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>